God without Mike and without you must be stressed from the heart attacks, blood pressure, I think I'm going to die. The one thing that every lecturer had common was stress. Excuse me, sir, I can't hear you properly. All right, sir. This is why. This is why. It's very easy to say manage your stress. It's very difficult to do. If it was that easy, everybody would do it. So. I did a talk about LIO or stress thing. Today I'm going to focus more on happiness and these are two different things. So let me start by asking you guys a question. Do you think money makes you happy? No. No. Anybody think money makes you happy? Money makes you happy? Yes. Okay. So the more you make money, takes away unhappiness away. So according to Ashfaq, the more you make, the more happy you would be money, to be a linear. Money brings you the tools which will make you happy. Well said. Here is the, here is the data, here's the Harvard data. Up to four, between 40 and $70,000 a year earning will make you happy. Anything more doesn't make a difference. So far, <laughs> And I'm going to explain to you what that really means. Why am I saying that? Because a lot of people back home are chasing money thinking that will make you happy. And I think scientifically that's not true. Why do you feel happy at a certain level of earning in the United States, 40 to 70 percent? Because what they say, money na more than nuksan, money more than fighting for what so if you are poor, that will hurt you on an everyday basis. But if you are filthy rich, then the next dollar doesn't buy you as much double roti as the first dollar does. So that's the demarcation. Does marriage make you happy? No, with your wife. Does marriage make you happy? Yes, marriage makes you happy more for women than men. <laughs> Does divorce make you happy? More for men than women? <laughs> the answer is divorce does make you happy. Isn't that very strange? And the take home message there is that if you are in a wrong relationship, then divorce is a good answer. Which comes to a daily point, when you want to stay stress-free and happy, think about it. We spend eight to 10 hours making money and the rest with our partner. And here's the statistics about it. Okay. I know the divorce attorney. You know So let's talk about happiness. Happiness is not just feeling good, it is actually good for you. People who are happy are 31% more efficient at work. 31% is a big number. Less at work burnout, less calling in sick. And doctors, you are 19% more accurate in your diagnosis if you are in a happy mood compared to when you are stressed out. 19% is like having an extra EKG or an X-ray. It's huge. So when you work for it in eight hours, you must be a genie from Aladdin to be able to do it. Because it really is very, very difficult. So happiness pays you back, which means you need to pay attention to it and acquire it. And happiness is a learned behavior to a large scale. You can learn to be happy. Now let's discuss uh, two different types of happiness. And I will come to your money-making issue here. Make sure you understand that there's a difference between short-term pleasure and enjoyment and long-term bliss and happiness. We all have experienced it. Short-term pleasure or enjoyment, and in fact, Deepak Chopra thinks that the term happiness should only be used for short-term feeling good because long-term is actually bliss, that you are happy and content with whatever and whoever you are. 
And here are the reasons why it is so important to separate the short-term gain and the long-term gain. So what happens is the short-term gain, gain is always a moving target. My school in this, I'll be happy. If I graduate, I'll be happy. If I get into residency, I'll be happy. If I make this job, I'll be happy. Because you are chasing a moving target, you will never achieve it. So you see a nine-year-old growing into 75 years, that person is still trying to get to the next target. It is a moving target. And every time you achieve it, the pleasure lasts for a very short period of time. It dies down. Everybody experience it? The second reason that you must separate short-term gain from long-term happiness is the following. Chasing short-term gain can actually make your long-term gain almost impossible. Or at least very difficult. So let me give you a very practical example. We think if we drink alcohol or do drugs, we will have a great evening. Not of us doing And that is true. But then, in long run, alcohol is a very powerful depressogenic. It is a cause of depression. So every day, every time, when you are chasing your short-term goal, you are making your long-term goal even further away. People who are busy making money, spend so much time making money thinking that that will make them happy that they lose the very human contact the with their business. Or do things that will make them happy, for example, meditation or eat right or exercise, because they're just too busy chasing their goal of making money. And so if it's happening on an ongoing basis, you're going farther and farther from the long-term place. Everybody clear on that? The money you're talking about, sir, when you buy a very expensive car, you're actually chasing that thinking it will make you happy, but it's going to die down. No, no, that is fine, right? So, here is how it works. You think you will work hard, you'll get successful, and after reaching that success, you'll be happy. What I'm saying is this, get happy first. Get the happiness advantage. The term is happiness advantage, created by Sean Aker from Harvard. You will be more efficient, more productive, that will make you more likely to be successful and you will be more efficient at work. So it's the other way around. Your starting point should be happiness, not what you are going to do in short term to get to the short term pleasure. Okay. Everybody good with that? Okay. So, um, how do we get happy? How do we get long-term bliss? Of course, you have to eat right and exercise, that's all good. But there are scientific data that tells you that you can actually increase your likelihood of getting happier than where you are. I'm not gonna think that any of us will become a clown, but you will be better. You will be happier than from your baseline. So here's how it goes. Think about three things that you think will change in your life. You will be happier, it could be Different spouse, <laughs> different set of kids, different job, different location, health, anything. And if I change those things, you will be happy. Well, then here's the news, here's the data. Everything that is happening in your life, all the external stimuli together, only predict 10% of the long-term bliss. Only 10%, the 90% is how you perceive those things, how you train your brain to see those things. And you can very easily train your brain. Train, train the brain for happiness is a choice that you make. Okay, so genetics, we talked about genetics. In studies, when they looked at twins and followed them for time, 48% of your baseline happiness with you 48% is big. It's the bad news, but the good news is that you still have 52% that you can manipulate. And you can. Major life events, divorce, death, major accidents, 
losses and gains are important but they do not last we just talked about it so this was a study done where they looked at people who were walking and jogging were in an accident became paraplegic in a wheelchair major disaster isn't it and then they looked at people who had won a very big lottery the number was 314 million average so hundreds of millions of dollars and they followed them and guess what happened People who were paraplegic, after three months, most of them, the study ended at one year, were back to their baseline level of happiness. It did not make any difference. And those who gained the money actually were worse off. They were less happy than from where they started. Amazing. Here's the reason why. When you got money, people wanted to be friends with you, you didn't pay attention to them, you lost the friends. It actually decreases your baseline social circuit. Because now you have more enemies. But once you lose the money, their perception of you stays the same. So, genetics 48%, main life, life events, short term but important. We should all try to minimize those that affect us. Now let's talk about the remaining choices that we make. Can you train your brain to look at things in a happier way? And the answer is yes. And it is effective. It is effective to the point where there are books written on it. Uh, Daniel Gilbert, Sean Akers, uh, a lot of people talk about it. So let me give you five things that Harvard authors have suggested to do on an everyday basis that increases your baseline level of happiness. That will impact how you perceive your main life events. And collectively, it should make some difference. So the first one is, it's so, so amazing that we did it, but we never knew, is gratitude. They ask you to do three things of gratitude a day. 21 days only. Can you do that? Three things of gratitude. Here's the key. Three new things of gratitude every day for 21 days. What does gratitude teach you? Gratitude teaches you to appreciate what you have. And if you are doing three new things of gratitude a day, the first 10 days will be easy. I'm thankful that I'm alive. I'm thankful my kids are happy. I'm thankful I have food to eat. But on week first or 10 days, you will actually run out of those common things. Now you have to look into things that you never thought you should be grateful of. You have to look into things that you took for granted. Then you look at the things that you thought were not really worthy of gratitude. And finally, you will actually start to look and find gratitude in things that looks actually bad on surface. Silver line. And what it does, it teaches your brain to look at the world and the events that are happening to you in a positive way. Number two, act of kindness. All they suggest is do one act of kindness out of ordinary. One act of kindness per day will make your brain to get the path of doing the right things that do not bite you from inside. So, for example, write a nice email to somebody you do not have to. Or show somebody something that you went out of your way to do it. Let me go back to gratitude. Let me clarify the definition of gratitude. Gratitude has to have two parts. A, you are thankful for something that you did not work for. <coughs> it is given to you free. If you work for something and you got paid, that is not what I am talking about as gratitude. And number two, the thing that is given to you is of enormous value. Very common example, life. It is given to you, you did not earn it, and it is of an enormous value to you. And if you look at those two parts and start to say, I am thankful, I am gratitude, that will train your brain to look at the world that way. The third is journaling, which is difficult to do, but in studies, that shows it's very powerful. Journaling of one positive experience a day. 
What happens is that we are clouded with our own negative experiences. If one bad thing happens, that will take away the whole 23 hours of your life because you will focus on that negative thing. Well, if you start to train your brain to focus on positive things, even one at a time, the brain will learn and it will take a detour and start to look at what is positive in your life. That has impact on your long-term happiness. <laughs> Two minutes, okay. Then, um, you go on talking about, think of positive, but this is very important, it will take one minute. Let me tell you something, what's the difference between I do not want to get sick and I want to be healthy? The difference is 100%. Your brain only hears the punch words. It does not hear I do not want to, it only hears sick. It does not hear I want to, it only hears healthy. And whatever you say to your brain, it starts to work towards it. From today, don't say I don't want to be late, say I want to be on time. Don't say I don't want to be poor, say I want to be rich. Don't say I do not want to be unhappy, say I want to be happy. And by repeating that, that is how your brain will come to that point. These are easy things to do. Last thing, exercise. Adegalayo, exercise has psychological impact because it tells your behavior matters. You have to do your muscular um, locomotion as ordered by your brain. It tells your brain that your body can obey you. There is a learning process. Here. Last 20 seconds, there is a thing in neuronal science called neuronal plasticity it basically means you can train new things to your brain. It's called neuronal plasticity. And the other thing is, I'm fine. And the other thing is that think about neuronal circuits. You make a circuit. The first time you sat on a bicycle, you had to think the pro pedal, steering seat, but with practice, you do it automatically. You combine those neuronal plasticity and neuronal circuits. Everything you can learn and it can become a reflex. It becomes part of you with continuous practice. And science shows 21 days of practice will develop a new habit. So try to do those five things that will create a better baseline of your happiness, which will make you look at things from a different perspective. And combine that, I think you will be able to manage long-term bliss much better than going after everyday stress and management. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have still uh, 20 minutes. Now, before I end, I'll do the two things. Number one, I will introduce John Gionejo. He's the pre med student. I feel really sorry. Such a young and enthusiastic person who wants to give a lecture today. But we are already running short of time, but I will invite him to please come to the podium. John, please at least introduce people. Hopefully, we should clap him. Look, look at his enthusiasm. He called me, but unfortunately, we were supposed to have two hours, but they gave us, I told him we'll do it, definitely. If I'm a moderator next year, uh, the first speaker will be John Junior next year. No, no, the mother is getting up saying, let me tell you one thing. John, have a seat, please. Sometimes, sometimes, Nazia, this happens even... No, sir, no, sir. You did 25 minutes. You are not supposed to. No, no. It's okay. Nazia, listen, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Be because you are... John, John, let me tell you. First of all, if you know or not. Five minutes, he could have spoken yeah. You okay? If the time rolls, I have no problem. I'm the one who really bring him up. Okay, I have no problem. If the audience is no problem, the speakers are no problem. He can come. Now, where did you come from? Please, please. Thank you. You want to speak? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Adelbas. 
So I had a, I had a lecture plan on uh, preventative medicine, but uh, looks like I'm kind of uh, short on time. So I'm gonna try that something a little bit different. I'm gonna combine the four uh, presentations, the main points that you should get out of each presentation into one presentation. And that's gonna be my presentation, okay? So I wanna open this, uh, when, when Ada Abazi, he, um, we talked on the phone, he said, uh, so what kind of doctor are you? I said, I'm not. What medical school do you go to? I'm not. Uh, I'm currently applying to medical school, so I cannot show the expertise that these fine physicians in front of you can. So what I'm gonna do is try to give you the patient's perspective on medicine and, uh, and like I said, tie the four basic points into this, right? So let's start. So I wanna open this discussion by talking about power. What is power? Power is getting to do, uh, is getting someone to do what they otherwise would not do, okay? Um, so as, as physicians, these people have lots of power. But who else has power? Patients. Patients have the power to resist any recommendations that these physicians can establish. And that's why it's so hard, as the, uh, for us, as the for us said, to implement these lifestyle changes in these patients that have type 2 diabetes. Because like you should know, when you have type 2 diabetes and you exercise, this increases the sensitivity to insulin. And this can better control the type 2 diabetes, but what do you get when you have a patient that has type 2 diabetes and you tell them to implement these lifestyle changes? They say, Doc, I'm gonna diet. I wanna enjoy the last years of my life. So I'm not gonna implement these changes, right? And so, and all that hard work goes down the drain. Uh, now I wanna talk about cardiac, cardiac disease, cardiovascular disease. Number one killer, right, in the world. 600,000 people die from this uh, annually. So I want to specifically talk about atherosclerosis. So this is a disease in which, um, like we just heard from the presentation, we see plaques, right, on these arteries, these deposits of calcium and cholesterol and, uh, and triglycerides. And in order to kind of mediate this, it's pretty simple, diet and exercise without even giving any hypertensive medications. So, um, <clears throat> this, is, this is what you can do. But uh, the, again, a patient can say, hey, I have power, I'm not gonna do this, I wanna enjoy the last years of my life. Now I wanna talk about, uh, about happiness, about stress, reducing stress. So we, we heard that we should reduce unnecessary stress. But the truth is, reducing unnecessary stress is not it's not something that is easily done, right? So how do you react to a patient that says, hey, I'm getting foreclosed on, right? I'm losing my house, I'm losing my family. So what can I do to reduce this stress? This stress is not unnecessary, this is necessary. This rules my life. And, uh, and that's, that's a question uh, that they should be able to answer. So at the end, um, I basically just want to say that in order to kind of react to the power that these patients exhibit, it's important to exert your authority as physicians, but it's also equally as important to understand their perspective and individualize the field of medicine. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. John, thank you very much. So we will bring it in. Before I end, I tell you that we here, we started it. I'm a speaker for 20 years. Sometimes speakers and moderate and his limitations. I went to Pakistan. Honestly, my name was official on the title. 